let me uh, introduce uh, Professor uh, Min Chin uh, Lee. And um, he studied uh, in Beijing University between 1987 and 1990 and participated in 1989 student democratic movement. I guess he can tell us what that means. Uh, I don't think it had anything to do with Tin Square, right? It, it was. Oh, okay, just kidding. <laughs> 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 because I think if you say that, you might not be able to go back to China. Between 1990 and 1992, he was a political prisoner. He received his PhD in economics from the University of Massachusetts Amherst in 2002. He taught political science in York University, Canada from 2003 to 2006. And since July 2006, he has taught economics at the University of Utah. His recent books include The Rise of China and the Demise of the Capital World Economy and Pig Oil, Climate Change, and the Limits to China's Economic Growth. And his latest and newest book, China and the 21st Century Crisis, was published in 2015. Okay, Rosalie, let's give him a yeah. welcome. Okay, King, th thank you very much for the uh, nice introduction. And uh, so some months uh, ago, uh, John wrote me and asked me to do a guest lecture in his class and say because uh, he was using uh, my book as his textbook. Right? So, so uh, I agreed and of course uh, with great pleasure. And then uh, John began to talk about, uh, I have uh, this friend and some other friends, so I have this suggestion, that suggestion, <laughs> so including uh, one of these occasions to talk to the local community of the Chinese Americans. And uh, so uh, this is, uh, frankly, uh, now this probably will be a, a something new for me, right, because uh, uh, I have not quite had a chance, even though uh, I'm a Chinese who have lived in the U.S. for uh, more than 20 years, uh, I have not really had a chance to talk to the Chinese American in a particular uh, local community. So, so this would be uh, interesting. Now, speaking about the Chinese American community, and of course it has something to do with China, has something to do with U.S. and too bad Louise just disappeared. I was going to ask her and what she thinks about China, right? <laughs> okay, so, uh, now uh, of course for, for anyone who has, knows something about world history, we know China used to be one of the, you could say, the, the greatest uh, civilization that historically existed in the world history. Right? Now in terms of the economic size, and we often talk about GDP, right? So GDP is the term for gross domestic product, so that is like the broad concept to measure the value of income output for a country <coughs> or for economy. So in this case, we are comparing uh, China, uh, the United States, and Great Britain, known as the Great United Kingdom. So, so the United Kingdom and the United States, of course, were respectively uh, the hegemonic power in the 19th century and then in the 20th century uh, for the capitalist world system. The red line here, that's China. Okay, so what we see here is the share of an individual economy in the total world economy. Right? So up to the early 19th century, China was still considered to be the largest uh, economy in the world and accounting for like basically like one third of the total world income output. But look at how China's share declined from the early 19th century all the way to the mid 20th century. Right? So, so over the course of one, almost like one and a half century, so that was like the, uh, in a way, the, the basic challenge uh, that has confronted successive uh, political regimes, uh, economic social systems that have existed in the history of uh, modern Chinese history from the early 19th century to the mid 20th century. How to respond to this new challenge imposed from the West? And of course, this decline of China 
coincided with the historical rise of the West, in this case represented by the uh, rise of the Great Britain and the United States. Of course, uh, if we look at the per capita GDP, right, so the previous graph looks at the overall income output, right, so in this case, we consider the per capita GDP, the total income output divided by population, right, and shown as the index. So, for example, in this case, 100, that is the world average. Right? So if we consider, say, the early 19th century, uh, there was a gap uh, between, the, uh, say, the Great Britain, US, and China, uh, but the gap was, say, in the range of between uh, 2 to 1 or 2.5 to 1, so it's not that big. Right? So some uh, historians actually would argue that as late as the 18th century, uh, if you consider China is a pretty big country, right? So if you consider the rich part of China, uh, say the lower Yangtze Valley, right? And they were considered to be as wealthy or possibly even wealthier than the Great Britain in the same period of time, right? But then again, by the mid 20th century, the gap between, say, Britain and China was widened to between 10 to 1. The gap between US and China was widened to 20 to 1. So, so this was like the uh, central challenge that confronted uh, the various political regimes in, in modern China throughout the 19th century and for much of the 20th century. So the question is, what was the broad historical background uh, behind this decline of China or the decline of the East compared to the historical rise of the West. Okay. So here lies one of the possible answers, or let's say uh, another uh, question in this case. And in this case, we are considering the total world income output, so we could call it gross world product. Right? And so this blue curve, that's the gross world product. And so in this case, we are looking at how the global income output had evolved from year 81. Uh, so year 81, so that's roughly speaking 2,000 years ago. So that's about the time of the, uh, so what for Europe uh, is in the middle of the Roman Empire. And for the Chinese history uh, is in the early years of the Eastern Han Dynasty, uh, Eastern Han Dynasty. Okay, so if you consider this, basically for something like 1800 years, there was virtually no change. At least, uh, you know, the change was so small, so we could not tell from this graph. Then somehow, starting from about 1800, we observed this dramatic exponential growth. So why was that? Okay, so part of the reason and we could consider some physical reason, we could consider some historical and social reason. Part of the reason has to do with the development and then the massive consumption of a new form of energy that was historically not available. Right? So historically, uh, the pre-modern or pre-capitalist society tended to use uh, various forms of what we today we would call renewable energies. Right? So like the wood or the various forests, renewable energies. Renewable energies now are considered to be good, right? but the, they were subject to limits. The limits has to do with uh, <coughs> if you say to consume the forest, it takes time for the forest to regrow. Right? So in other words, it's constrained by the natural rates of regeneration. The fossil fuels, by comparison, say the coal, uh, natural gas, and oil, right? So the fossil fuels, and on the other hand, would represent the solar energy that was accumulated over millions or maybe billions of years, right? But that was, however, consumed by the human civilization just over the past 100 or 200 years, right? So, okay, so with this, Massive consumption of fossil fuels that provided a key energy foundation for the modern economic growth. So in this case, the red curve, that is again the gross world product, the measurement of the global income output, right? 
And so that is like the last portion of the blue curve in the previous graph. Right? And then we have these dark solid points, and those are the carbon dioxide emissions because of the fossil fuel consumption. Right? So that would represent uh, the level of fossil fuel consumption. And then you could see for much of the modern history, these two curves basically go together. Right? So one of the question is whether we could continue to have this red curve skyrocketing in the future and somehow turn around the black curve. That, that's a big question. If we cannot turn around this black curve successfully, and one of the major concerns is that with this growing emission of carbon dioxide, it could trigger major climate catastrophes and then major uh, ecological catastrophes in other forms that might potentially undermine the human civilization. Okay, so that would be the uh, one of the key challenge for the 21st century. <coughs> okay, so materially that, that has to do with this uh, consumption of fossil fuels. And this consumption of fossil fuels moreover has been made possible by a new kind of economic system. So what is this new kind of economic system? It has to do with what we call capitalism. Right? So we live in a capitalist society, but what exactly is what exactly is capitalism? So depending on your perspective, depending on your political position, people might often come with different kind of definition. Right? But there's one basic reality, whatever definition of capitalism would have to uh, deal with. So basically, capitalism is unique in the sense that uh, it is a system, this kind of, uh, of course, say money or market had existed in human history for a long time, right? But to use money to make more money, and moreover, so in this case we represent that by MC to M prime, to use money to make more money, right? And moreover, to make this the dominant economic dynamics, this has been something new. So this was not the dominant uh, economic dynamics uh, that existed, say, before the 18th century, before the 17th century. So this kind of capitalism and first emerged in Western Europe in about 16th century and did not really become a globally dominant system until the 19th century. OK. okay. Now, when we talk about capitalism, of course, uh, capitalism has always been characterized by very uneven or unequal distribution of wealth and income. And uh, I know many people here have participated in uh, activism uh, in one form or the other, right? To fight against inequality in one form or the other, right? But when we talk about inequality, we think about inequality not only within particular community, not only within Los Angeles, not only, say, even within the United States. The right? United States is just a small part of the entire human world. Right? Now, if we talk about the world as a whole, you can think about the different geographic areas or different countries in the world can be, roughly speaking, divided into three different structural layers. And so we call them the core, the periphery, and the semi periphery. Right? So the core area is, is where the wealth of the world has been concentrated in the capitalist area. The periphery, on the other hand, refers to those areas that in the past has included the greater majority of the world population, but where the wealth, or let's say surplus value, has been transferred from the periphery to the core. So the basic question for modern China was that uh, the historical Chinese empire used to be uh, considered to be the center of the East Asian trade of trade system. And then according to some historians, it could be said to be the center of the uh, super Asian uh, world economy, which included not only East Asia, but also much of the the Indian Ocean, uh, the areas surrounding the Indian Ocean. And so basically, uh, that was where the historical uh, center of gravity uh, of the global economy was located. Right? 
And then, so China was reduced from what used to be the center of the Asian super world economy, then to the peripheral member of the capitalist world system. And that, of course, was reflected by not only the economic decline, but also the impoverishment for uh, much of the population, but also various successive military defeats, uh, loss of uh, territorial and uh, uh, integrity. Uh, okay, so that was the, the basic challenge. And then what happened was that uh, successive regime from the Manchurian Qing Dynasty uh, to the uh, warlords in the early Republican years, and then of course the nationalist government failed to respond to this challenge uh, effectively. So why was that the case? Uh, there was a, a classical study by Carl Riskin, who, was a, uh, uh, who is a, still a famous American economist and who studied on these kind of issues. So he had a paper in the 1970s where he talked about in the traditional Tsar China, or let's say in the pre-revolution China, although there was a sizable income surplus, that income surplus could not be used in a productive way, or let's say could not be used for industrialization or accumulation of capital, because much of that was either exploited by foreign capital or just wasted by the landlords in the rural areas. And so to respond to this new challenge in, imposed by the capital world system, it would re require effective uh, mobilization of income surplus. But that could not happen unless there was some kind of fundamental transformation of China's class uh, structure of social classes. In other words, that could not happen unless you eliminate all the traditional ruling classes and then transform the state fundamentally. So that was basically the historical rules of the modern Chinese revolution, or let's say the, the Chinese communist revolution, right? and from 1921 to 1949. Okay, so it would require this kind of uh, fundamental social uh, revolution in order to mobilize the income surplus to respond to the modern challenge imposed by the capitalist world system. But for this kind of revolution to happen, of course, it would in turn require some social force. If you want to eliminate the historical ruling classes, obviously that could not happen unless you could mobilize the entire lower social classes. In other words, unless you mobilize the, the, all the laboring social classes, especially the peasants, and otherwise the state structure could not be transformed. So that was the uh, historical foundation of the People's Republic established in 1949. Okay. So now we have got the People's Republic. And then uh, it began to engage in uh, modern industrialization and to some degree I would argue it was uh, quite effective uh, in terms of accomplishing this immediate historical objective. Right. But remember this new People's Republic was the historical product of a great social revolution. It was based on the mobilization of the great majority of population, especially the peasant workers. So that means the new state now have to come to some understanding with the laboring classes. Now this does not necessarily mean this understanding has to be, uh, say, uh, accomplished in some written form, although there was constitution, etc. Uh, but there was basically a, a kind of social relationship that prevailed within the People's Republic of China for several decades right? that was more or less accepted by various social groups within that kind of social framework. So the basic understanding was that on the one hand, the new state, now the People's Republic, of course led by the Communist Party, would be in the position to mobilize the income surplus that used to be wasted by the landlords and uh, exported by foreign imperialism now was available uh, for the People's Republic to be used for accumulation of capital and industrialization in other words to promote modern income growth. Right? But on the other hand of course for this to happen 
the workers and the peasants would have to at least temporarily accept low level of material consumption. Right? So that was uh, in a way inevitable. But then to justify, to legitimize, uh, or let's say to, to honor the new socialist social contract established because of the People's Republic, right? And there was the uh, understanding that uh, this new uh, People's Republic, Republic of the Common State was going to use this economic surplus only for the long-term public good of the general population. Right? And uh, this uh, involves some short-term and long-term implication in the short term. And so this surplus was going to be used for capital accumulation, not for the privileged material consumption of the Communist Party and the state officials, right? And therefore, the idea was that the Communist Party and the state officials, known as uh, cadres or gang group, right? and in the Chinese context, uh, was going to share the material sacrifices with the masses together. Okay, so that was part of the socialist deal. Right? And moreover, the, the workers, of course, as well as peasants, were going to be provided by a minimum social safety net known as the IRS ball, and uh, so uh, to, to compensate to some degree for their acceptance of the low material consumption. And then moreover, in the long run, and uh, uh, this uh, socialist uh, building was going to lead to not only material prosperity for everyone, but also uh, gradual reduction of various forms of economic and social inequality until you eventually accomplish uh, the classless uh, communist uh, society. Right? So that was the general social understanding. Okay. But uh, you can imagine this kind of social contract uh, could not be very stable. Because as soon as the People's Republic was established, and, uh, and then uh, at least some of these new Communist Party officials would begin to take advantage of their new political power to pursue not only the public good now, but also part of the personal gains. That would include not only political power, but also material privilege. And so as a result, there was this growing conflict not only between the party and the message, but also between different factions of the party leadership. So on the one hand, you have, say, uh, Mao Zedong, right, so, so the Chinese Communist Party leader, and who would argue that and the Communist Party leadership should uh, honor this socialist social contract. Right? And on the other hand, you have people like Liu Shaoqi or Deng Xiaoping. So Liu Shaoqi was the uh, like the president of the People's Republic from 1959 to 1969, and uh, most people I assume know about who Deng Xiaoping was about, right? And uh, so the, the people like Liu Shaoqi and Deng Xiaoping would argue that uh, with the establishment of a new state, now the Communist Party officially could focus on the development of, development of product forces, right? using a the Marxist terminology, right? Basically, it means that the party now could focus on industrialization, and if necessary, uh, say, economic social equality could be sacrificed for that purpose. Right? So we have this growing conflict between these factions that then uh, led to the uh, major political upheaval of uh, cultural revolution uh, in the second half of the 1960s. And then, of course, that ended with the defeat uh, of the Maoist faction uh, within the party, right? which in turn paved the way for China's capitalist transition. Okay, okay so that was about the China's internal political change. Now let's put this back. Let's put this back into the global context. Okay, so we just talk about very briefly, of course. <coughs> China's transformation from the 19th century to the 20th century. In the first half of the 20th century, it was a time of major crisis for the entire global system. Right? So if you think about that, there was the First World War from 1914 to 1918. Uh, there was the Great Depression, and uh, which uh, the 
worst part of the depression lasted from 1929 to 1933, and for most of the global economy did not really recover from the Great Depression until the beginning of World War II, and then of course there was World War II, right, from 1939 to 1945. Okay? So you can think about this entire first half of the 20th century as a period of time of major instability for the global system that almost uh, destroyed, it came very close, right, almost destroyed the entire global capitalist system. Of course the system then survived, and then with the end of World War II, there was uh, a clear winner, right? uh, United States, and that then became the indisputable hegemonic power of the entire uh, capitalist world system. The U.S. in turn led the restructuring of the global capitalist system that in turn created conditions for <laughs> unprecedented boom of the uh, global economy. Okay, now, um, leaving aside some of the details of the global restructuring of the global capitalist economy in this period of time, the period from 1945 to 1973 was often referred to as golden age of global capitalism. Not only because this was time when the global economy experienced unprecedented rapid growth. And moreover, in much of the world, not in every part, but in much of the world, this growth was more or less evenly shared between different social classes, if not across nation states, at least within each nation state. So if we, let's see. Uh, so this is a graph showing the it's called profit share uh, in the national income of U.S. economy. Okay, so you can roughly speaking, I think about this as the share of the capitalist income in the overall national income in this case for the United States. Right? And this, this was from 1929 to 2015. Okay? And so from 1929. And then there was a dramatic decline over the course of the Great Depression, and then it did not recover. It did not recover even in the 1950s, right? And even though there was some increase in the profit share in the first half of the 1960s, it was followed by quite significant decline. And then in the early 1970s, it was at an unprecedented historically low level. So, in other words, it was time when capitalist class did not do too well, you know, from the capitalist point of view. Uh, indicators and say the inequality or the measurement of income inequality, right? So if you look at say the share of income for the top 1% population, the share of income of top 10% population, you basically, you are going to get similar uh, impression. Okay, so from 50s to 60s, there was unprecedented boom. When you have a long-term income boom, it has some consequences. First of all, it reduced the level of unemployment. And then, moreover, in the Western economies, it reduced or depleted the remaining rural surplus labor force. So when you have less rural workers, when you have lower unemployment rate, the consequence was that the workers would have stronger bargaining power in the labor market. Right? Now, the workers have stronger power, that's a good thing. Right? And that means, at least in short run, the workers can enjoy higher living standards. Right? But under capitalism, if workers have higher income, the implication is that the capitalists are going to have lower profit. Right? But capitalism is a system based on profit. Right? So if the capitalism have lower profit, but you are still staying within a capitalist system, that's not sustainable. Right? And then moreover, of course, another consequence uh, of the capitalist restructuring of the World War II had to do with that the capitalist class made some systematic concessions to the working classes, not only in the US, but in many other parts of the world. Uh, in the form of uh, making some uh, 
institutional change, like allowing the labor unions to play a greater role, like allowing the welfare state, the, the development and construction of welfare state, right? So all of that contributed to stronger uh, working class power. And so that happened not only in the Western core countries, but also in many semi peripheral countries like Latin America, like uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, you can think about like Eastern Europe's uh, Soviet Union also belonging to the semi periphery. Right? So all of that by the 1960s led to this profit squeeze, and as we just talked about, and that was going to result in accumulation crisis. And in addition, of course, the 1960s also observed the relative decline of the American hegemonic power. So, so many in this room probably participated in the anti war movement uh, in one way or the other, right? So you know about how the uh, defeat of uh, American imperialism in Vietnam and contributed to the uh, decline of American hegemonic power uh, at the time.